I'm going to call this meeting to order. This is the December 2020 meeting of the Bloomington Environmental Commission. Um, since Linda is not here, I will be taking role today. Um, we'll just go right down the list. Uh, Bailey Anderson. Make sure you're uh, unmuted as well. Sorry, here. Bye-bye. Perfect. Just want to make sure it's on the record. Matt Cauley. Here. Susanna Evans Comfort. Here. Meredith, Meredith Dickerson. Don Eggert. Here. Andrew Gunther, I am here. Shelby Hoshaw. Present. Mike Litwin. Here. Daniel Olson. Dave Parkhurst. Yep. Excellent. A quorum is reached. Um, we'll count those as introductions as well, since we don't have anyone new at this meeting to introduce ourselves to. Um, we'll move to approval of minutes. Everyone get a chance to look at the minutes from last month. Were there any amendments to be offered to those minutes? There were, and he made them. Um, I move right. to accept the minutes. Dave moved to accept the minutes. Anyone second? Second. Excellent. We'll, we'll go down the list for roll call again. Bailey Anderson. <laughs> Bailey? Sorry, I think I... I thought I hit my mute button. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. Matt Caldy? Yes. Susanna Evans Comfort? Here, yes. Are we doing attendance again? No, we're doing uh, the motion to approve the minutes. Perfect. <laughs> Meredith? It's not here. I'm sorry. Let me mark that down again. Don Egger? Here. I sorry. Uh, yeah, I. I move. I move yes as well. Uh, Shelby. Approved. Mike. Yes. And Dave. Yes. Motions approved unanimously. Move on in our agenda next to public comment. Are there any members of the public that wish to make a comment tonight? You can raise your hand and our host will call on you um, using the raise your hand feature in the chat. Yeah. I don't have anyone just... raising their hand, Andrew. All right, we'll give them a 10 more oh, seconds. Wait, uh, Scott Robinson. Scott? Good evening. Uh, my name is Scott Robinson, uh, Director for Planning and Transportation. I just want to introduce myself. Uh, wanted to join you meeting this evening and say hello. I don't really have any public comment. I just wanted to, again, introduce myself. Um, it's been a while since I've been to an Environmental Commission meeting. And as my new role as a Planning Director, I just wanted to take an opportunity to reach out to say hello. And if you guys uh, have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out to me or my staff. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. And I'm sure I speak on behalf of everyone else on the commission when I say congratulations on your new role as director. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Um, any other public comment uh, this evening? Not seeing any, Ben? Yeah, no one's coming up. <laughs> All right, um, we will see no more public comment and not many members of the public to make comment. We'll move on to our presentation for the evening. Um, our presenter tonight is Lauren Travis, who is the Assistant Director of Sustainability for the City of Bloomington. Um, and she will be talking about the Hoosier Reliance Index and the readiness assessment. So thank you, Lauren, for being with us this evening. You have the floor. Thank you. One second, I, uh, can you enable my screen sharing? I'm not able to share my screen right now. Oh, there we go, maybe. Okay. 
Okay, so first I wanted to provide a quick introduction to the Hoosier, Hoosier Resilience Index. And this was an index developed by Indiana University. And I think Andrew Webster, who used to be on the Environmental Commission, has played a huge role in developing this. And it's a tool for local governments to try to determine how prepared they are for the effects of climate change. Um, if this works, it's a quick video that just provides a preview, and then I'll get into how that applies to Bloomington really quickly. Should we be hearing him? I'm not hearing him. Neither am I. You can't hear it? No, I can just, I can hear some feedback, but not the actual words or. Okay. Well, if it isn't working, I'll just send you the link and we can get started on the presentation then. Okay. So. I'm here today to talk about the Hoosier Resilience Index and how um, it's been a tool that we've used as an organization to fit in with the rest of our climate and sustainability planning work. There's, I'll send you the slides afterwards. That YouTube video basically is a couple of mayors talking about how climate impacts have affected their towns across Indiana. And um, they were working with Indiana University to create this kind of assessment to figure out what are the best ways to prepare for what's going to happen with increasing frequency. And so while you might not have been able to hear very well, that was the mayor of Huntingburg talking about how they've had 100 year floods with increasing frequency. And it's been very difficult as a local government to respond to that with the resources they have. So this index, um, which was part of the Preparing for Environmental Change initiative was developed by IU to help communities understand um, where to focus their attention. I mean, many places have limited resources and a methodology to see how they're progressing towards becoming more resilient. And there were two parts. Um, one was to assess climate vulnerability. So high heat days, precipitation, extra rain events, how land use affects their vulnerability and socio-demographics. So if you have uh, more people that are already um, in higher need or at risk because of uh, poverty reasons, then it's likely that an event like a flood would be something they would be more vulnerable to. And then part two, which I'll focus more about was specific to local governments and it was a set of questions. Um, we worked with different departments to obtain a score of how ready, um, based on these questions developed by researchers, we are for the effects of climate. <coughs> so, and this is publicly available on the IU website. This is for <coughs> particularly, but it shows currently we have about um, 12 days that are high heat in a medium emission scenario, which means that um, we're kind of on trajectory for that anyway. There Should I be seeing something? I'm not seeing anything on your screen. Is, are other people seeing it? Yeah, I, I'm still seeing the paused YouTube video. Uh, oh, no. Um, I didn't realize you were using a PowerPoint until I heard you. Oh, I'm in. so sorry. Okay. Um, That's better. Okay. Um, yeah, so the YouTube video, and then I was speaking to the, the two sections, climate vulnerability and the readiness assessment, and then this chart. So I'll stop here, but um, basically there's two main impacts that Indiana can expect from climate change, and that's heat and precipitation. And um, currently we experience about 12 days of high heat days, and so that stays above 85 degrees. In 2050, based on modeling, we can expect about um, 29. This is not sort of necessarily the outcome. Uh, you know, if we're able to combat and reduce the emissions, it's possible that we could be in a low emission scenario, but kind of all other things equal, um, we can expect that those number of days would double. So that's almost equivalent to an entire month in a year where you would have days that um, people are experiencing over 85 degrees. 
and also more nights that are high heat. This is important because people's body temperature isn't allowed to return to normal and that can create health impacts. So that was one thing that this assessment looked at. So in different areas of the state, there's different severity of heat impacts the further south um, and even past Bloomington and Evansville is going to experience climate change a little bit differently, but not extremely differently. And then um, extreme, extreme precipitation, this is also a concern. So we're having about 19 um, events per year and it's variable. So this is an average, of course. And then um, in a different emission scenario, that would be about 22. So some increase it, and those events could be of variable amounts, but that's a concern because flooding is a very expensive um, impact from climate change. If there's damage to buildings or property, it tends to be one of the more costly impacts of climate change. And then the questions that um, we looked at about resilience, they were modeled on these ideas of to be resilient means that you are flexible to changing conditions, that we can buffer against loss, um, and basically understanding that the entire community is a system. And so one impact can lead to another and a domino effect. And what's our capacity to reestablish after damage? I think this is especially, um, you know, important this year as we see how one event, the public health crisis we're in right now has had so many subsequent um, impacts. And so you can imagine that if we're experiencing something like a flood, what are gonna be the subsequent impacts of that and are we ready for those? So um, in order to answer these questions, we talked to a lot of different people across the organization. So. Um, ranging from public works to planning, street, um, economic and sustainable development, risk management. So it was a really comprehensive set of questions to really figure out as, as a local government, as a city government, um, are we ready? Are there areas that we need to particularly focus on? Um, also another section was public health and safety, um, planning and land use. So some of these functions are also shared by the county and the county actually is also working on this assessment. I think they're expecting to be complete with it shortly, but talking to a lot of the same people to figure out, um, are there some relative strengths between city and county ways to coordinate and work together um, as we experience these impacts? So um, what I thought, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, after we looked at all of that, basically um, it showed that we as a community answered the questions pretty similar to the other town communities that completed the assessment. And while their scores are private, we can see that as an average, um, we scored a little bit higher on extreme heat readiness, but then um, basically almost the same as other Indiana communities. And I think that makes sense because the development patterns and the type of impacts that we are expecting are pretty common. But that also shows that there's many things that we can do to prepare. Um, and so that's also what I wanted everyone to take away from this is while um, we're ready to some extent, there's a lot of things that we can still do to prepare and to make the impacts of climate change less severe. And then um, this is our score broken into different areas. Again, I'll share these. So we did, um, we scored better in the built environment extreme heat score. And I think that some of that can be attributed to increasing standards for efficiency um, and building performance. The I wanted to put a note on the public health and safety. Since we're in the middle of a pandemic, I didn't have the opportunity to, to speak to the director of emergency management, but we'll get those scores updated once we do. So those don't reflect her responses yet, but we did pretty well in natural resources and as a tree city and in a city that's really committed to reforestation, I think that is reflected in that. But um, basically, um, you know, about average, I think the most useful thing to take away from this is that there's still a lot of room for improvement and that we're not sort of like equally ready in different areas. There's different things that we can do in emergency management, like, um, it, especially in communications with the public about emergencies that can help improve response. And that's not the only way that we're looking at vulnerability. Um, if you are interested, 
back in September, I presented to council climate vulnerability assessment that showed that we're especially um, susceptible to the effects of air quality changes and extreme heat. Um, that's also posted on the sustainability page, but that just provides another like more in-depth analysis of those vulnerabilities if you're curious about any of them in particular. Um, things like energy costs, which are rising, um, increased food insecurity, and other uh, impacts that will increase over time. And then that's, this is also from that assessment. So we can look at current hazard risk levels. So what's an issue right now? Um, basically, things like wildfires are not really as much of a concern, but floods are currently a high risk hazard level. They're expected to increase to become more frequent and that's a short term impact. So that's important for planning as, as a city to think about, okay, if we have limited resources, how are we gonna allocate and preparing for these impacts? And then to the population, so if, if more of the columns are in red, that indicates it's more of a concern. Then again, you see flooding um, because of infrastructure impacts, but then also um, increased demand for cooling, like air conditioning, especially for people that are um, vulnerable to impacts and heat related health impacts. Um, so I can speak more to that in the questions, but just wanted to provide, that's the summary table from that report if, if you are interested in just skipping to the end and seeing the conclusions. And then um, it's not enough to sort of just assess what the problems are, we need to evaluate the solution. So um, we're currently working on an action plan about how we're gonna reduce emissions as a community and adapt to change. Um, this is still in draft form, but it's on the sustainability page. The timeline is that we do have a current draft um, that we're working on. So if you have any comments, feel free to provide them as well, either to my email or we have a feedback form as well. If you prefer answering more of a survey version and then we'll have a public forum um, after like January for further comment and feedback from different stakeholders and then uh, hopefully acceptance by council in 2021. So um, in conclusion, there's a lot of planning work that's going on in, in preparing for sustainability and climate impacts. I am also the staff liaison to the Commission on Sustainability. Um, so I'm happy to continue to coordinate with your commission on a variety of issues, but wanted to be available for any questions that you might have or clarifying comments or concerns. And thanks for inviting me here today. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, do we have any uh, comments or questions or concerns for Lauren this evening? Did you say you'd be sending these links to us or? Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, thank you. <clears throat> Mm. So, uh, I think Don's saying something. Uh, oh, cool. Somebody was, else was going to say something, start to say something. Um, I, I do have a question about uh, the existing floodplain hazard FEMA maps for floodplains. Mm -hmm. uh, the most logical thing with increased precipitation is the uh, area of risk in the existing FEMA floodplains, which now are several years old, um, are likely to uh, increase, uh, expand uh, <clears throat> both in, uh, in elevation, particularly, uh, therefore width, um, probably, uh, Detailed maps, um, vital tool, uh, I guess, basically is what my, uh, but is that being factored in at this time, the increased area? Yeah, I think one of the things is, um, you know, most of Bloomington's generally already developed, but uh, utilities is increasing investment in green infrastructure <laughs> to try to reduce the impact of some of that flooding as well as ensuring that future development takes that into account. I know that the FEMA maps aren't always up to date, but we have a good sense of our floodplain and the areas that have been impacted most frequently. I mean, IU 
has had issues with flooding of Jordan River quite frequently, and that's increased over time on campus. So um, I think that making those investments in areas that continue to flood across the community will be important. And so I, I know there's been some um, major utility replacement projects that have happened um, to try to mitigate some of that flooding. But yeah, I mean, it's something to definitely keep in mind. And I think that basically increasing investment and in, in reducing the area of flooding will be important moving forward so that less property is impacted. Do we have any existing, um, ha having worked with Vandiver County and Evansville, um, they went to try to, uh, as they were working with FEMA, as far as the uh, flood insurance program, they were trying to uh, really put some teeth into the uh, preventing further development and flood prone areas. Uh, do we in, in Middle County and the city have, how have we done in that area? I would probably have to defer to Linda. That might be in the Unified Development Ordinance, but I'm not sure, so I don't want to speak out of turn, but I'm sure. Uh, we ba basically we don't allow um, development unless there is um, a really good reason and somebody comes forward and um, then we follow um, DNR regulations. <clears throat> the big weakness in um, flooding is the most costly uh, natural hazard in the United States. It costs more than tornadoes, hurricanes. Well, hurricanes also incorporate flooding, but uh, it's if it, it really is a loss issue and also it's a human life issue of uh, life safety. So, the physics, something to think about as we go. The physics of this increased precipitation is pretty simple. That. Now that the earth is warmer, there's more water evaporating from the oceans and from the land. And so there's more water in the air. And that's the explanation for all these heavy snows out east right now. So, And uh, one another correlation is going to be in severe, uh, not thinking beyond uh, in extreme weather events, we also need to consider the increased likelihood of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. Um, and again, the research shows that the duration and the start dates uh, of uh, tornado season, as an example, are getting longer. And particularly one that's more noticeable is the uh, second half or the second uh, yearly cycle of severe weather that comes in the fall. Um, so outreach, outreach, outreach. Yeah, I think education is obviously an important component of this, and especially if you're someone that uh, has a house in Bloomington, thinking about how the drainage in your yard is uh, possible. The, the stormwater <laughs> grants are open for homeowners again for this year, and so that's been really um, successful through utilities and getting some rain gardens and other things implemented. And then I'll um, in 2021, we'll have a promotion also for people to get compost bins and rain barrels so that they can think about managing their own impact and institutions as well. But um, obviously there's a lot of people that are affected by this and can play a good role. Hmm. And also, I guess with the, with the climate change courses to increase risk of uh, disease. Mm -hmm. I don't have too much time. <laughs> no, I was just going to ask if there are any more questions for Lauren this evening before we move on. Thank you, Lauren. We'll actually be discussing the climate action plan later, um, and I'm sure we'll um, appreciate this extra lens to look at it through. Sure. So thank you for presenting for us tonight. Thanks, thank Lauren. Uh, we'll move on to our reports from various committees. Um, is there a report from Tree Commission? I know we received the Urban Foresters report, but was there anything not included in that? Um, yeah, well, we had 
probably the shortest meeting I can remember. It was only a half an hour. Uh, after the urban foresters report, uh, we got a report from the member from IU who said that over the last year, they've planted about 100 trees in various places of campus. And that sounds good to me. Um, and they're changing their tree donor program. In the past, the tree donor program has allowed people to donate a specific tree. And then uh, it got a plaque on it. And the plaque, plaques kept disappearing, among other things. And so they're now going to have people uh, who want to give money about trees to the university would uh, sort of uh, deal with an area rather than specific trees. And then they wouldn't have to worry about the plaques. So <laughs> that was one of the main um, points in the, the meeting. Every meeting they ask for a report on the Environmental Commission from me. And so I told them about our last meeting dealing with the, uh, the uh, justice statement and um, one other thing that we did last meeting that I've now forgotten about. And, oh, well, the, it's not coming to me, but, um, and then I always tell them since usually the meetings, uh, the, since they meet the third Wednesday and we meet the third Thursday, most months, uh, they meet before we do. So I tell them what we're gonna be doing the next day. So I just went down the agenda and told them what we'll be doing today. Um, that was about the last thing. Oh, well, then they asked for a report from the four of us. There are four of us, including uh, George Hegeman and Tom Coleman and Dedamia, uh, our a little committee that uh, since they decided that the, the trees out at uh, Bachelor Forest uh, were not since that's out in the county and it's the county library and a county school, those would not be uh, appropriate business for the city's tree commission. So uh, the four of us formed a separate little committee to look into that. And it turns out that at four o'clock this afternoon, there was a, a meeting of the uh, plan commission, the county plan commission's plat committee where they looked into a proposal for the, the school corporation to sell part of the land out there to, um, to the uh, library. And so we just had a report on that from somebody who went to that meeting. But um, so the next, in the next few months, probably the library will be sending their plans for what they actually want to do with that land to the plan commission. And we want to follow to see what they're specifically representing. Ultimately, the four of us would like to see them put up signs uh, around the forest explaining how it got to be there and what are its good points and so on. And uh, that won't be official business of the tree commission, but uh, we'll be uh, uh, lobbying to try to get that done. And so that was the end of our meeting uh, after a half an hour. End of Thank report. You, Any questions for Dave about the tree commission report? Seeing none, we'll move on to the Monroe County Environmental Commission. Um, they mostly had a meeting to uh, go over their schedule for next year. Um, they did receive a presentation from Lauren uh, Travis about the Bloomington Climate Action Plan, um, but they didn't take any formal action um, at that meeting um, on that as far as I can tell. So um, any questions about that? Seeing no, move on to the Bloomington Commission on Sustainability. Um, I their last the meeting this this uh, this month. Uh, they did not have a quorum of projects. Again, one of the things in general summation I would have of that commission and our commission, and just including somewhat the impression from their members 
and my own personal view that we need to be working together more uh, as because of our overlap of our uh, mutual work and outreach, of course. Um, I did, I also posted today the, um, which is sort of relevant, I think, to just in general, I don't know quite where else to bring it up, but I did post the MC Iris meeting, which again, uh, their activities touch on our interests as well as uh, the Sustainability Commission. Um, so, uh, and, and also I posted today a article about the trees, which gets into the tree commission. And, and also everybody's uh, planet. Uh, it was report from the UK about climate change. Uh, you need to take care of them, which means invasives as well as the, our ongoing issues with uh, our urban deer. So I thought that uh, I figured it was worth posting for, for all of you. That's all I have. Thank you, Don. Um, does anyone have any questions for Don about BCOS or MC Iris report he sent out? Seeing none, move on to ERAC. Do we have a report from ERAC this month? <laughs> Not exactly. They met uh, a, week, a week ago on Wednesday, and I was at my wife's farm in Kentucky and didn't manage to attend the meeting by Zoom, so I can't give you a report. I, when, the, when the minutes come through, which will probably be just before the next meeting in two months, I'll send those on to you. Okay. Thank you, Don. Dave. Um, any questions for Dave on that? Seeing now, we'll move on to the MPO Citizens Advisory Committee, who did not meet this month. Um, so no report on there. Um, do we have um, a report from Friends of Lake Monroe? Uh, we haven't met recently. We'll be meeting on January. Uh, was going to be on uh, Martin Luther King Day, so they moved that to a week later, but it'll be in fairly late January when we meet next. Okay. Any questions for Dave? Seeing none, we'll move on to our working groups. There's an A cycle this month, so we'll be discussing um, ECPC and Plan Commission. Linda, do you have anything for us this month on the Plan Commission? I don't this month. Uh in January, we will have uh, a couple of uh, cases that we've already discussed that have been continued, um, providing they'll remain on the agenda from, for uh, January, but I have nothing new to report. All right. Uh, seeing as there's nothing to report, I assume there's no questions as well. And seeing none, we'll move on. Um, again, the... Uh, Working groups are part of our discussion that we'll have at our uh, planning meeting for next year um, to see how we're going to implement those via Zoom um, to the best of their ability. But uh, at this point in time, we're only discussing ECPC and plan commission. So we'll move on next to old business. Um, our old business today is the conversation on plexes and city zoning. Um, we have a letter um, that was drafted for a guest column in the HT um, by Susanna and Matt. Um, about plexes. Uh, do either of you two want to discuss that uh, letter? So it was also requested that we get kind of a, a brief summary out there of what the zoning proposal is before we go over what we would like to say. Um, okay. So I was going to kind of quickly try to cover that to the best of my ability. Um, the proposed a few different zoning areas, but a couple of them are not controversial because it's like green space or student housing. But what we're talking about is a new R4 or residential urban zone. And it's basically small scale lots that offer kind of a diverse mix of housing opportunities. Um, the properties in these proposed to be R4 uh, areas have um, really great access to a bunch of public services. So it's very walkable and bikeable. 
Um, they basically started by identifying any lots that were fewer than 5,000 square feet, which is pretty close to a tenth of an acre. Um, they then kind of created a, a 50 foot buffer around those properties to determine if there were any clusters. And then they took those clusters and any kind of intersecting ones and formed an area and chopped off little bits if there wasn't like a, if they weren't connected to a continuous right away street. And that's how they came up with the blocks that they chose. Um, basically, they said that they wanted to make desirable home locations more accessible to more people. And they thought that was a key to making a successful and sustainable future for the city, which they also mentioned in a, uh, a number of uh, paragraphs under it. They have projections that the city is expected to grow. And in order to meet some of the growth um, demands, they need to take advantage of opportunities for housing, retail, employment, and entertainment kind of near these, these, uh, these most important nodes of the city. So they have kind of smart growth strategies moving forwards for their development. Um, hopefully, Yes, David. You're muted. Yeah, not anymore. Um, how many of these new uh, zones are they talking about? And I wonder what fraction of areas that are now single family would, would move in that direction. Would, would, sorry, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by the, the last part. Which... Well, there are areas that are now zoned single family. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, okay. Would any of those be changed to this new system, this new type of zoning? Um, I'm not super familiar with the names of all their zoning uh, prior to this proposal. I saw a bunch of stuff about R1, R2, R3 as, as different different degrees that I think were basically determined again by the, the size of the parcels. Um, and so the reason they chose the ones they did from what was R3 before, which is, isn't exclusively single family. Um, I think there's uh, conditional duplexes or something, but not, not some of the uh, bigger footprint buildings. Um, so I believe it was all areas that were previously R3 that they're suggesting would be in the new R4 residential urban zoning. And, and an R4 zoning is concentrated around downtown. Um, an example of R4 neighborhood would be Elm Heights. Yeah. To give you an idea of what kind of neighborhood that would be. Yeah, that was the, that was the one they used in, in their proposal there, but they're, they're kind of scattered around near in places that density makes the most sense, however. So it, it's either very close to campus, very close to downtown, or there were a couple very close to the mall is where the, the bulk of the, the proposed spots were. I had a little Dave, Dave you, can see, you can see the map if you go to the city's website under planning and transportation. Um, um, there's a map that shows um, the current zoning districts and the proposed zoning districts if you want to look at the map yourself i had a little trouble telling if uh, if the r4 districts and the uh, proposed plexus areas were exactly the same were all the plexus limited to r4 district or they also would be uh, allowed in other areas um, I can address that, and, and maybe Linda, you can confirm. My understanding is that um, plexes would be allowed in all um, a residential, uh, currently residential zone neighborhoods. It's the quadplex that would be limited to the R4. Right. Okay. So the R4 is the small. You know, it's it's just kind of pockets, uh, as Andrew just referenced, um, near downtown and, and near the College Mall generally. Um, the other neighborhoods uh, would be would allow duplex or triplex, um, and I think that to me an important distinction that it took me looking at the proposal several times to figure this out. And maybe again, Linda, you might have more expertise and you can confirm this, is that it wasn't that no one could get a duplex or a triplex uh, proposed before. You just had to go through the process 
process of rezoning, right? And you might get rejected in that process. It was more of a check. Now it's just, it's removing the check um, and allowing it um, by right in certain areas. The quadplexes would be reserved only for the R4 area. <laughs> so there's three types of plexes. There's duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes or fourplexes. Um, duplexes would be permitted in all the neighborhood zones by right. So they don't have to go through a city approval. They just have to follow the site specific standards set out in the EDO for duplexes. Triplexes would be by right in R4. Um, they would not be allowed in R1 and they'd be conditional use in Rs2 and 3. And then the quadplexes or fourplexes are conditional use in R3 only and permitted by right um, in R4. So R4 really allows all the quad, all the plex sizes, um, while the other ones only allow some by right, um, some by conditional use, and some not at all. So there's a there's a table. Um, I'll send a link in the chat right now to the UDO uh, map update site. Um, there's a table on the right hand side column that breaks down the different zones and what's permitted and not permitted in those zones. Yeah, and the map is really right. helpful. Well, I mean, you can identify your own home and that, that helps me understand it as well, like what are they actually proposing? Um, so for example, I've, I live in Old Northeast and it, the name be uh, zoned R4. Um, so uh, it would uh, allow, you know, the quadplexes um, where I currently live. I think that um, the map being available to the uh, public with the understanding of what, uh, where you're at and what's allowed would perhaps um, ease some of the tension in the community. Uh, if the public knows, I mean, the reaction seems to be pretty hostile. Yeah, and, and that map is available. I mean, it's been on the website for, and, um, um, you know, a while now. But are people... Um, people might not be aware that they can access it. Well, uh, that's, that's what I'm getting at, if that can be publicized. The, the coverage of it by B-Square Beacon and Indiana Public Media and, and all the major people that cover Bloomington have shared the links in their stories. Um, so it's it's been available since... October, I think. I'm not positive, but it's it's there to be looked at. Well, and and if we could turn our attention to the letter specifically and what what the role of the EC is in this. Um, so Matt and I talked about this um, about the EC making a statement on this issue, and I'm aware that it's an uncomfortable issue in Bloomington and it's controversial. And you know we're going to be going through this for the next several months um, talking about it. So. Um, in terms of debating specifics of the proposal, that seems arguably beyond the purview of the EC, um, unless it's specific environmental in nature. You know, something about like whether this neighborhood should be included or that neighborhood should not be included or quadplex versus triplex, whatever. Um, it's hard to find an environmental angle, specific angle on that. So, you know, we kind of thought we're not going to necessarily comment on that it doesn't seem within the purview of the body of the ec we all have our opinions about it for sure and how it might affect our neighborhood but that seems beyond the purview of the ec so um what we were trying to do with this letter um is to reflect on the broader environmental impact uh, of compact city planning so we're trying to thread a needle a little bit um, i do think it is important to speak on this topic because there is an environmental angle that has been more or less ignored um, by at least the media coverage, both last year and this year. And I'd like to see it in there. Um, I'm not saying that we should, I, I hope that the, the draft that we proposed um, is nuanced enough. It doesn't show us, you know, saying we should definitely adopt this. It's just saying we should add this to the conversation. Um, so I did get some feedback from, uh, I'll get to you in a second, Dave. Uh, I, I did get some feedback from Don, which was incorporated into the draft that I sent you most recently. Um, but I didn't get feedback from anyone else, aside from Mike said, you know, he, he liked it, it seemed okay to him. Um, so we're definitely open that, and I, you know, we will be open to adjusting this. Uh, I've spent my life editing and, and changing documents around. Um, so, 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 David, did you, did you want to ask a question? Did you no, I didn't get anything from you, Linda. Did, did you get what I sent? No. Okay. 
I will uh, try sending it again. Matt, did you get anything from Linda? Okay. Um, so Dave, you had a question? Yeah, my uh, maybe two questions. The first is, uh, well, it's all the same. Uh, have you looked at the number of words and the number of words that the Herald Times allows? This looks too long to be a letter, but uh, would it then be a column? That's my first Yes, yeah, so it would be a column. Okay, and the second thing is I support it. I, I move that we do send it. We have a motion um, to approve it. Oh, we can have a second and then move into a discussion period if you guys would like. Um, okay, is there a second on the motion? It. I'll second it. All right, move into a discussion period um, about the motion. Is there any further discussion on topic of the Plexus letter or any amendments anyone has to offer? Mike, I see your hand. Yeah. I finally figured out to hold up my hand. Uh, a little background on this. The previous version of this was, I believe it was uh, open to all residential neighborhoods, but it was limited to the corner lots on blocks. Mm -hmm. So that was a little bit more restrictive. Um, Many years ago, there was a uh, lot of uh, uproar because of what was perceived as blockbusting. I remember particularly the Elm Heights neighborhood. Uh, they were concerned <laughs> that developers were coming in and trying to buy houses so they could rent them to students, which would, uh, if they could do that enough, eventually it would lower property values. People would want to move out because they wouldn't want to live in a student ghetto, and then they could buy more houses cheaply. Uh, real or not, that was a real perception. So that may be some of the background behind some of the concern on this. And I know it's similar to what uh, Chris Sturbaum has mentioned. Yeah, the current um, main or one of the main, uh, I don't know what word to use, one of the main marketing pieces by groups opposed to the Plex plan um, ask the question, do you want a fraternity living in your neighborhood? Um, because they're concerned that large groups of fraternity members would buy up a quadplex um, and then live there in a core neighborhood instead of close to downtown instead of a specific fraternity style home or apartment building. So um, it, it, it's, a it's a maintained and longstanding concern that has been voiced by people, whether or not it's real, um, we've yet to see, but uh, it is something that comes up again and again in this conversation. I like um, the are, way. Is there anything, Dave? I like the way the column talks about the environmental, uh, just points out the envi environmental advantages of greater density without making specific recommendations of what should be done, I think. And, or that's how I read the column. And that's why I think we should send it off. Uh, yeah, Matt. Yeah, I just I'm glad to hear that we seem largely in agreement. I just kind of wanted to touch on a couple more reasons why why I support it. One, one of which was covered in the in the letter um, mentioning from the draft climate action plan that we haven't spoke on at length yet because that's next on our agenda. The decreasing vehicle travel by eight percent. There were at least a couple other reasons that I could see that were also listed in in the climate action plan about uh, increasing density by gross density by 3% and uh, what that kind of translates into for the city for every 1% increase in population density in the cities. They said that uh, high skilled wages increase, carbon emissions decrease. Um, it just, there were a lot of things that are in line with the city targets. And so I know that, you know, a lot of people are gonna be concerned about uh, backlash for possibly putting our support behind this proposal. What I personally felt and really wanted to emphasize was I feel that it's a, it's a good faith effort from the city um, to promote sustainability and equity. So while there are far more demonstrated economic and uh, like social equitable benefits to increase density, there, there are plenty of sustainability and environmental ones as well. And I don't think this is just an attempt to make as much money as they can and blow up the neighborhood. I think it's what they say it is. So that's why I hope we uh, send the letter. 
Could I add to that is I also, uh, one of my feelings is uh, I see this also as a social equity or social justice rather um, issue as well. Um, and particularly the, the potential of um, lowering um, some of the housing costs uh, for people who work. I mean, one of the real, real transportation issues, so many of the low income people uh, cannot afford to live in the city. And some people can't even afford to live in the county. So they drive in from Lawrence and uh, Green and uh, uh, Owen, uh, Clay, et cetera, uh, into the county. Uh, strong, besides environmental, it also has a strong uh, social justice uh, component to it. Yeah, as someone who um, has not made it a secret that I'm not a big fan of the city's proposal here, uh, I have some specific um, amendments where I on the plan commission that I would offer um, regarding where these plexes can be placed in. And uh, I have some doubts about the city's claims about affordability and that sort of thing. Um, I still feel represented by the letter. Um, the letter does do a good job, I agree, um, with making sure that we're advocating for more density, which is my goal, um, which is, I think, is the goal of all of us. Um, we may disagree about how to get there, but we agree that there is benefit, at least, in, in density occurring. So um, I, I am supportive of this letter. Um, I am um, not endorsing the city policy wholeheartedly, but I am endorsing the idea of a denser Bloomington um, in the future going forward. So. Uh, I support the letter as well, um, and I'll be voting yes. Uh, is there any further comment um, on the uh, Plex letter that we plan to send to the HT? Call the question. Dave, call the question. Um, we'll move into a roll call vote. Um, going right down the list again, uh, Bailey Anderson. Yes, of course. Matt. Yes. Susanna. Yes. Don. Yes. Myself, yes. Shelby. Yes. Mike. Yes. And Dave. Yes. Motion passed unanimously. Um, I would say that Suzanne or Matt, either one of you can work together um, to get that submitted um, as soon as you are able to. Um, one thing I will say is if you're close to the word limit on the HT, the HT's algorithm sometimes counts some words that I would consider one word as two words. Um, so you may actually end up finding yourself a couple words over um, if you are close to the word limit currently, just giving you that warning, you may have to edit one or two small things. Okay. Uh, thank you for that tip. Um, uh, thank you to everyone for even considering it. I know it was like, this is a tough issue in Bloomington right now. Um, well, I have one question about the logistics of submitting it. So how is it signed? Is it signed, you know, Susanna and Matt, since we wrote it, you know, kind of together, or is it signed the environmental commission? Like, how is it, how do we want it signed? The way that we've done a lot of our past columns is you would have the author, which, I mean, you, we talked about it a lot, but, but you wrote it, you should put your name under it. Um, mm -hmm. And it would just be then like comma, uh, member of the Environmental on Commission. Of, type of thing. Yeah, or on behalf of the okay. Environmental okay. Commission. Yeah. Yeah. It's also been true that a lot of letters that we sent in the past were signed by the chair. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be exclusively by the chair. But. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I would say since Susanna, Susanna wrote this, it's it's totally fair for her to be the one with her name on it. And uh, remember, we have to have the disclaimer mm -hmm. on the end. Yeah. Uh, remind me of the disclaimer. Uh, yeah, we might. Uh, I might send that to you uh, tomorrow uh, because if it is uh, goes out to the public under the Environmental Commission's name, it has to has have the disclaimer on it. So I'll send that to you separately. Okay, thank you. 
You're and welcome. You can reach out to Carol Kugler, who's the one in charge of guest comms for the HT, um, about getting that disclaimer added on. Uh, in the past, I believe they've added the disclaimer on without adding it to our word limit. Mm -hmm. um, but you'd want to reach out to her directly about that, and I can send you her email later on. All right, thank you. Um, any further comment on the Plexus letter or questions or concerns? I'm seeing none. Thank you, Suzanne and Matt, for that effort. I know it took up some time, and uh, we're thankful for you guys for doing that for us. Appreciate it. Um, moving on to new business, our draft, uh, the draft climate action plan for the city, um, and our discussion on that. Um, we we sent out the draft action plan, um, climate action plan, um, to you all um, via email. Uh, I know most likely we haven't had a chance to go through the entire document. It is over 150 pages, um, but uh, I, I at least looked over the executive summary uh, as well as the media coverage surrounding it that's been put out so far. Um, and really, um, the this isn't supposed to be an in-depth discussion regarding our specific policy amendments we would offer or our specific comments on um, the actual uh, meat and bones of the proposals within it. Um, but I would say that we should um, have a discussion on A, whether or not we want to submit formal comments to this plan like we did with the UDO, um, and two, whether we want to, um, how we want to split up the duties uh, of doing that. If we want to split up, you know, assign two people per chapter of it um, and have them go through it, or if we want everyone to go through the entire thing, you know, those are the types of questions I envisioned us discussing um, on this this evening. Um, does anyone want to start off with anything that they, Dave? Yeah, well, I propose that we take up this topic actually. And um, I've started, I, I've read uh, the executive summary. I've read the food chapter since it's one of my main interests. And I tried to read the last part. Uh, which is in such small type that even though I have pretty good eyes, I wish that the consulting firm had used bigger type uh, and it's a real pain. Uh, I'm a compulsive editor and I will uh, send comments about places where it needs editing like words, like word hop or, or yeah, it's supposed to be work, workshop, but it's word, work hop. And uh, there are lots of places where they needed better uh, people to look over it and correct it. But there are two uh, issues specifically that I'd like to bring up. On page 12-3, there is this statement at the bottom which says, engage city boards and commissions e.g. Commission on Sustainability, Planning Commission, City Council, Climate Action and Resilience Committee, et cetera. Well, I think the Environmental Commission should be named specifically there too. And uh, I hope you all agree with that one. Uh, and let's see if I can find my other uh, specific. Oh, there's a place where we ought to mention our, it, it ought to mention our, um, I'll come to that in a minute. Our habitat connectivity plan, that ought to be mentioned in the section called green space and ecosystem health. Um, and I doubt that it is. So how do we get it in there? Yeah, I, I agree. I think, um, my main concern about this proposal from the beginning has been the fact that, um, well, I agree with the with the contents and I agree with the the, the general idea. Uh, I wish that they would have consulted the Commission on Sustainability as well as us um, as they were drafting the actual document. Um, I think um, when they say things like we should engage the boards and commissions. Um, in a report that they wrote without input from boards and commissions. Um, I think that's a little bit of a, um, 
a unique juxtaposition. So uh, I, I, I would I would agree that we should that we should push as part of our amendments um, that the EC be more forcefully included within the document so that when they look back and reference it, they can see, oh, we're supposed to talk to the EC about this as well. And they won't have any way to um, essentially not uh, want to engage us on those discussions going forward. I also object to, um, I don't know, there are people who write things these days and they use cutesy ideas like um, in, the, in the food section, there are, there's white text in yellow background that's almost unreadable. And why people don't sort of pay attention to making what they're writing readable, I don't know, but that's a real annoyance to me. I had a very hard time reading the white text in the yellow background in the food section. Good point. So that's among the feedbacks that I will send. That's about all I have to say. Do we have any um, further comments on whether or not we should take up? I think we're probably all in agreement that we should. Um, I don't want to assume, so we'll take a vote on it. But I, I, my perception, just from knowing you all, um, is that you, you all generally would agree that this is an important topic for the Environmental Commission to give input on. Um, so I think the conversation then evolves into um, how would that process look uh, going forward? Um, so I, as I said before, you know, it's a, it split up into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine sections, not including the appendix and glossary. Um, so whether or not we wanted to split up the sections and have one or two people read each section, or we want to have everyone read through the entire document and provide comments on everything within the document, um, that's a conversation we should be having um, about it. Matt, I see your hand. Do, uh, this could be a dumb question, but do, do we feel that all of the, uh, the chapters, the nine chapters you mentioned are things that we have enough knowledge of that we should be amending or just the environmentally most specific ones or how, how would you suggest it? Personally, I think most of them fall within our general purview of things we've at least commented on in the past through the UDO, for example. Um, so the, the actual um, sections are transportation, energy and built environment, local food, waste, water and wastewater, green space, health and safety, and climate economy. Um, and I think um, at least the majority of those um, are stuff that we've at least directly commented on in the past. Whether we want to now, that's totally a legitimate conversation to have. Um, but I don't think there's anything in there that's too drastically outside the realm of possibility for us to at least review and put input on if necessary. Um, Dave? Yeah, I had asked Lauren to stay with us for this discussion and I thought she was going to since she's sort of in charge of the whole thing. Uh, and she seems to have left us unfortunately, but I would have asked her the question, how much time do we have to actually to influence this thing is when is it going to be considered wrapped up because I, I don't I don't know the answer to that but um, um, the first round of comments um, I think that deadline is has passed it was the 11th so they will take um, the comments from the first round of comments and right now they are incorporating those and they'll be rewriting it and they'll send it out again. But I don't think it's meant to be passed until the first part of next year. The next version of the document that includes all the comments they received or whatever comments they choose to incorporate um, from the 11th deadline should be released in January. Um, which also begs the question whether or not we should proceed uh, with this version or wait until the January version comes out. I would argue that it's probably best to start reviewing the document and so we have a good basis between now and January and then go back through 
uh, and look at your comments that you have submitted and go through the, your sections that you've submitted on. So like if, if you've submitted a comment on wastewater, um, after the next version comes out, I would go back to that section that you had commented on specifically. So you go to that paragraph and you say, oh, they actually changed it to what I like or better or something that I can agree with. Um, and then you wouldn't have to submit that amendment. Um, but I think that saves us from waiting until January, getting the new document, reading through the whole document. And then we don't know when their deadline will be for comments. It could be two or three weeks later. Um, and then we're kind of stuck on a time crunch between then and our next meeting. Um, that just makes no sense to me. If anyone else has any, anyone else has any other ideas, um, I'm more than open, obviously, to hearing those as well. Well, I'm going to go ahead and send my suggested edits just in case they'll have an effect. And um, I've paid attention, especially to the food section, as I said, and I don't have any criticisms of what they're proposing there, just for some of the places where I don't like the writing, so. Your, your your typos or even the white on yellow feedback you could you could probably just uh, reply to the email they had there. I, I did one. I saw one where they had a duplicate on two different bullet points with one in between them, and I responded saying you you probably don't want this here twice. And Lauren responded really quickly with a, we'll get that fixed. So <laughs> at editing type things, I don't think we even need to talk about it. You can just send them the hey, this was a typo. But content-wise, we, you know, it'd probably be good for us to discuss. Right. Like yeah, I agree with Matt. If you, if you have a problem with the white text on yellow background, which I also have a problem with, um, I would just send that email out or fill out that form um, when you have those comments in mind. Um, and then we can submit any technical amendments that we have like we did with the UDO. Um, that way, your amendments get incorporated separately as citizen comments, and they'll probably get incorporated quicker than us going through the EC process of approving things um, that are stylistic in nature. Yeah, well, I, I have probably 20 editorial comments, but I do have those two things that are substantive, namely to get the Environmental Com Commission named explicitly, and secondly, to get our habitat connectivity plan talked about in the section called Green Space and Ecosystem Health. I haven't read through that, but I doubt that our environmental, uh, our habitat connectivity plan is mentioned in there, and I think it ought to be. I agree with the with David on the uh, connectivity um, because that has a lot has a, could potentially have a significant impact on both trees as well as other forms of wildlife. Um, and it also dovetails with, again, the, the uh, MC iris and other, other groups' interests. It also seems to me that this entire plan, from what I've read, um, and as I say, the very last section has such tiny print that I'm really having trouble mm -hmm. reading it. Um, but it seems very general and not terribly specific about well, it says what we need to do, but not how we would do it. And um, so that mm -hmm. troubles me a bit. I think there are some specific proposals in the document. Um, I haven't reached the specific section myself, um, but I do know from the media coverage around it, specifically the B Square Beacon, um, they did mention that there is a table somewhere in the document that outlays um, a, a 150 or 200. Um, specific uh, action items to take um, regarding things like increasing density by 3%. But I do agree that they're not super specific on how to achieve those goals. And I think that's to give the city a little leeway in, in how they do that. So um, they don't want to say increase density by doing X, Y, and Z, and then the city have a great new option that doesn't fit in that. I think that's the logic behind that kind of setup. Um, I see Matt's hand. Um yeah, kind of along those lines, what exactly should we be looking for in, in our review of it? Because there was a, I don't know, I was largely impressed by the four or so chapters that I read, um, but I don't know, I'm just a regular citizen, if they say our goal is to increase tree canopy by 3% by this certain year, should we be trying to push them for a larger percentage or should we just be reviewing 
their their processes that they would want to go through to try to achieve that goal? Like how how should we be looking at this uh, to to edit? Another comment. Personally, I have, another comment I have about this thing is, it feels to me as if the consultants who wrote this had already written this for some other city and they're just moving it over into Bloomington. It feels very much like that. I it's wouldn't it. be surprised. They, they did. There, there's, a, there's a copy with the exact same graphics you can find for, I think it's a city in Ohio, um, which is common <laughs> with consultants. That's not to say anything negative about the consultants or the city. That's perfectly natural for people to reuse the art that they have. Um, saves money on graphic designers, which I can attest are um, pricey at times. Um, back to Matt's question, I would say um, that would be flushed out within the process itself, like with the UDOs. So I envision it being that individual commissioners will read through the report or their assigned section of the report, depending on how we do it. And then they'll prevent, present to the commission whatever amendments that they think are necessary. So they can be things like adding in the EC to certain you know, groups to work with, um, to we want to increase tree density instead of 10%, for example, to 15%, um, like we did with the UDO. And then we can discuss as a group at that meeting whether or not we think those amendments are worth pursuing. And then we can trim down from ones we think are less likely to be implemented to ones that we think need to be implemented the most. And then we can present those as amendments um, in our comments to city planning. And then as it moves forward through the city council, if we need to, um, through the city council as well, like we do with the UDO. Um, I think they're virtually similar, except that this is a smaller scale project than the UDO was. Um, so there's less things to comment on potentially, but there may be roughly the same considering this entire section is environmentally focused, whereas the UDO um, was not always environmentally focused. Right. To a certain degree, I think that some of the sections it would be easy to speak on, and some of them I think I was trying to read maybe energy in the built environment or something, and it got pretty technical pretty fast, and I don't even know how I would criticize mm -hmm. some of that. But to Dave's point earlier about the green space one, I, I think you're right. I don't think there was any mention of our, our connectivity plan, but there was just like a generic mention of connectivity. So it was, it was pretty obvious where they could put it. Um, if I remember correctly, it was last week. When yeah. I read it, but. yeah, two things. Um, I would say that one of the benefits of the proposed idea to assign sections to people, so people would you know, say they want to work on certain sections, not others, is that would allow some people with technical expertise in those areas, you know, the people who are on this commission, who are scientists who have worked in these fields, um, might be able to look at those areas a little bit in more in depth than um, you or I might be able to, Matt. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm a policy wonk, but I'm not a scientific wonk. So I need to have people, um, look over technical sections more, more specifically, but there are sections, like you said, with tree density that I think we can as under understand enough as a commission as a whole, um, to advocate for, um, but like you said, some may be more technical than others. And I would hope that those with the technical expertise would, would claim those sections and work on those as well. Uh, Linda. I, I think that's a really good idea because um, um, using the tree example, um, it, you know, it says in there to increase the uh, uh, tree canopy by 3%. Well, I'm not sure. I, I think that somebody needs to go um, dig a little deeper and see what does the comp plan say? What does the beep say? What are all these other bunches of plans that we have say, is this consistent uh, with the other plans? And you could say the same thing about um, uh, CO2 reduction. Uh, we've got so many plans that have so many um, um, reduction uh, goals, and I don't know if they match, and I think it would take time to look through all of those. Uh, which is why I don't think anybody could do that for the whole document. I think I should write to the tree commission and su suggest that they uh, look into this plan, particularly for numbers of trees and maybe comment on that. Uh, I'll suggest to MC Agris, uh, uh, 
of the same thing because it uh, building on what David just said, um, there definitely would be interest in it as well. Um, I guess Is one of the Good, sorry. Could uh, no, go I'm, ahead. I'm yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to... Um, one of the things I've been doing for again for the last three years has been paying close attention to trends in energy transportation, or the use of fossil fuels to replacement with green energy. And as an example, uh, uh, um, Davida with the sustainability. That I, I think that sure uh, uh, structure, but uh, she's taking a, a very close, paying very close attention uh, to green hydrogen, um, which is really on the radar screen. Um, and even with the discussion of the uh, particulate, uh, as far as the effect of particulates, uh, the coal industry is losing its war globally. And it's losing its war uh, here in the United States on basic market principles. Uh, so some of the things uh, that are now are going to definitely change and hopefully for the better. Um, so we need to really look at our, I think in terms of what our expertises are, where we can address things uh, that are in it and get back to uh, uh, learn as quickly as possible, start the process of getting, you know, getting, helping her and, you know, help, which helps the city to get this done. Okay. Sorry, my cats were fighting. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, excellent. So trying to keep them quiet for y'all. Um, all right, so I, I think we're all basically in agreement that it's at least worth us looking over and reviewing. I think that's part of our charge duties in our charter with the municipal code that we review these types of things. Um, so I would entertain a motion from the floor to uh, officially initiate working on the climate action plan as one of our priorities for the next couple months. Okay. Is there a motion on the floor? My question comes back. Do we actually have a couple of months to be useful? Oh, oh so Scott, um, put, put in the chat. Um, I'll read it out loud. Um, Scott Robinson says, I asked Lauren the same question via email on the climate action plan. She explained the timing has slowed down. They wanted comments as soon as possible on this version, but another release draft we released in late January. They will then follow more engagement by uh, economic and sustainable development and consultants for more feedback. Um, so it, it sounds like there will be uh, more comments. Um, that's what was indicated by Suzanne, uh, not Suzanne, I'm sorry, by Lauren in her presentation um, earlier this evening. Um, so I think we do. Um, I think there will be an opportunity to do this because I don't think it'll pass um, super quickly. I think it'll be something that will require a decent amount of work um, from the city council as well as uh, city mm -hmm. staff. Um, so I have a motion, I believe, from Don. Do I have a second? Second. Excellent. Move on to a roll call vote. Moving down the list, Bailey? Yes. Matt? Yes. Susanna? Yes. Don? Yes. Myself, yes. Shelby? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Excellent. We, um, I'll send out an email about organizing um, how we're going to split up the document and review. Um, so look out for an email from me in the next day or two about that um, so that we can split it up as soon as possible. I know all of you are looking forward to crowding around um, 
your uh, specific uh, holiday garb and uh, reviewing the climate change um, climate action plan proposal. I know that's look, what all of you want to do on your holiday break. So um, we'll try to get that sent out to you as soon as possible. Um, if there's no other comments on the draft climate action plan, we'll move on to our discussion regarding a uh, Environmental Commission Facebook page. Um, I believe uh, this is Ben's topic, correct? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, so I just thought it would be a good idea to increase the footprint of the Environmental Commission and give updates on what we're doing um, every month or so. Um, and yeah, engage more people in the public. Excellent. So, um, Ben's created a Facebook page to engage the public more, more frequently, which I completely agree with is a good opportunity for us to publicize various uh, topics of environmental interest. Um, I've proposed um, what we'll discuss later in a little bit, um, a social media policy just to give guidelines officially in our mm -hmm. handbook um, regarding um, the social media page um, for the EC and how we will manage it. Um, part of that uh, policy um, says that we should vote um, on establishing these pages before they're created. I created that after Ben had already created the page, so there's no, you know, nothing Ben did was wrong. Um, but I, I would ask, just so we have it uh, officially on the record, that we do take a vote um, on approving an official Environmental Commission Facebook page. I actually um, haven't made it I yet. Would, uh, so, um, it oh, he hasn't made it yet. yet. So, perfect. We can still have that vote, um, and it'll be official, and um, it'll be done before. I thought I was already created. I'm sorry, Ben. I misunderstood um, an email. Um, so I would accept a motion to approve um, the creation of a Facebook page for the Environmental Commission. Is there a motion on the floor? Motion to approve. Second. Anna, she moved, Pat seconded. We'll move down the list. Bailey? Yes. Matt? Yes. Susanna? Yes. Don? Yes. Myself, yes. Shelby? Yes. Mike? Yes. And Dave? No. And the reason I say that is whenever Facebook started to exist, maybe 15 years ago, I don't know, I'm guessing, I signed on for uh, when it first came out. And as soon as I looked into what they were going to do with your data, a week later, I quit. And I have no membership in Facebook. And now when people mention Facebook, I say, what's that? Because I have no nothing to do with it. So I vote no. I'm also right. a the Facebook motion passes resistor. I don't use it either. <laughs> so you see a pattern? Well, I hope that the Facebook page will to reach out to um, plenty of other people. And I hope that uh, uh, we can continue to get everyone involved in EC in some way. Well, it's, uh, but I appreciate the candor. It's clear that the, the motion won because there's only one no, I guess. But anyway, I had to get that in. It's, it's OK to be a conscientious objector up there. Uh, Could I have stayed? <laughs> It's all right. It's just a good outreach opportunity, right? <laughs> I'm also morally allergic to Google because they keep track of everything you do and they sell that information to advertisers and to others. And they give you all these free uh, apps and things, but there must be something pay paying <clears throat> for it. And it's, it's selling your information to others that pays for it. And so I try to avoid Google as much as I can. Mm. Um, are there any further comments on the creation of a Facebook page for the EC? 
seeing none, we'll move on to a new business, which is the social media policy. Um, so I sent you all an amendment um, that I had drafted um, regarding a social media policy um, that also included a social media policy for individual commissioners, just regarding that we don't appreciate, you know, commissioners who post things that um, go outside what the Bloomington Human Rights Commission establishes as discriminatory behavior. Um, we withdrew that on advice from City Legal. That is something that they need to look into a bit further. Um, and that could cause problems for the city. So we withdrew that portion of the amendment. Um, the current amendment as it stands has two different parts. So I've separated it into two different votes for the amendment process. The first cleans up some language with concerns I had, and I'll read the language out loud here in a minute. Um, the first had concerns I had regarding conflict of interest. Um, it, I, just, I just clarified the process for declaring a conflict of interest um, that any commissioner might have. Um, in a more clear and concise way. Um, so it's more officially on the record. Um, that way we're, make, we're making sure that we're avoiding any potential improprieties that may pop up um, through any future planning cases or anything similar. Um, and then the second amendment establishes a social media policy um, for the uh, environmental commission run social media pages. So not individual commissioners, but just Facebook pages or Twitter pages or whatever other social media that we adopt. Um, that is used primarily by the Environmental Commission for Environmental Commission business. Um, I'll read out the First Amendment um, currently um, that I have written. Um, it is uh, an amendment to the Bloomington Environmental Commission Handbook, Section 3, um, to read as follows. And I'll just read the sections that are substantially changed here um, within the amendment. So it is uh, Commissioner Responsibilities and Guidelines. Um, a section C, ethical policy and expectations. As appointed public representatives, commissioners must hold themselves to the highest ethical standards when conducting commission business. Commissioners are expected to make their best efforts to avoid conflict of interests and to notify the staff liaison to the commission of any potential conflicts of interests prior to any discussion or votes that would establish the potential conflict of interest. Members with a conflict of interest before the commission must recuse themselves from the vote or discussion unless a majority of the commission votes to acknowledge the potential conflict of interest and waive the recusal requirement. Um, just to give a little background on why I chose that policy process, that's the same process um, that as far as I know, the city council and planning commission uses. So if, mm -hmm. a, city, so if a city council member has a comp potential conflict of interest, they raise their hand and say, hello, my name is John Smith. I have a potential conflict of interest because my wife works for X company. Um, I believe I can act impartially in this decision-making process. And then this other council members can vote to accept that conflict of interest and allow them to continue voting in the process. That allows it just so that we have a process in place because I think there are many instances where someone may have a potential conflict of interest, but it's not a real conflict of interest that actually generates um, any direct monetary gain for them. So an example would be, I used to work in property management regarding neighborhoods. Um, and when we commented on the, on the UDO, we did have sections of the UDO that did establish how many, um, or how the building process for new neighborhoods and subdivisions within the city. Um, I didn't specifically declare that because I had no financial stake in the company, but I think that this allows it so that we can still participate in the process and uh, make those potential conflicts of interest known. So that way we don't have to go backwards and potentially have a, a circumstance where someone um, has to recuse themselves and from the conversation when they may not necessarily have needed to. Um, I see Linda's hand being raised. Yes, um, thanks. Um, that It is the exact same um, policy as the city council and the plan commission use. At least the city council. Um, the plan commission, I believe, follows the same policy, but the city council, I have watched them make that same type of vote. In the the reason I ask is um, um, I don't think it's a wise idea for every uh, board and commission to come up with their own policies um, when we actually volunteer for the city and they have their, I mean, the city has um, a conflict of interest policy and of course, I don't have it out in front of me. I can't read it for you. It could be this exact same thing verbatim for all I know. But I don't think that we should, that the uh, Environmental Commission or any commission should have its own policies separate from the city. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I would agree with why I chose to go off of the city council policy. Um, so for an example, what the city council's done in the past was when they were voting on budget budget discussions for util for um, housing and or housing and neighborhood development. Um, Council member Jim Sims to Doris Sims, who runs the hand department, raised his hand and said, you know, my name is Jim Sims. I uh, am married to Doris Sims, who's the director of the hand department. Her salary is funded by this ordinance. I believe I can act in an impartial manner and still vote on the ordinance as a whole. And then the rest of the city council members voted up or down whether or not to accept that. Um, the majority did, um, so then it was declared that the conflict of interest was was notified and waived by the body in charge of the decision making process. If you want to hold off on it and wait until we get um, the city's policy in writing, we can. I'm just going off of what I have seen as an observer at many city council meetings in the past. Right. Well, we might want to just you know hold off and see what the city's policy already says, because I mean we have to follow that as um, commissioners anyway. Okay. Our, our commission handbook didn't have a policy in place on this, which is why I added the amendment in, in the first place. Our handbook only said that commissioners are expected to avoid conflicts of interest, and that's all it says. Um, so it didn't give any actual methodology for actually avoiding the conflict of interest. It just said you must avoid them. Um, but I completely agree. We can, we can hold off on this one um, and wait until uh, we have the, the city... Uh, policy in writing in front of us to compare. Um, so with that being said, I withdraw the First Amendment for conflict of interest policy. Um, and I will move on if there's no objection directly to the amendment on social media policy, if that's okay. Seeing no objection, we'll move on to amendment number two, which is to amend um, the miscellaneous section of our handbook. Um, to read as follows. So there's, um, it adds in section B, social media policy. Social media accounts created for the explicit use of the Bloomington Environmental Commission must be used solely to disseminate commission business and information regarding environmentalism, conservation, environmental scientific discovery, environmental policy, or any other business that furthers the mission of the commission. Personal views, non-commissioned topics, and vulgar and obscene materials will not be permitted on the Bloomington Environmental Commission social media accounts. Any social media accounts created by the commission will be managed by the chair and staff liaison to the commission or their designees. Social media accounts must be approved by a simple majority of the commissioners present at any meeting of the commission that has a quorum. Post to quorum, posts to commission social media accounts do not need to be approved unless otherwise required by this handbook, statute, or Robert's Rules of Order. In the instance of a commissioner's objection to a posting, they may ask to have said post removed, and the chair in consultation with the staff liaison shall have the final determination on whether a post is removed or retained. Social media is defined for the purposes of this policy as all means of communicating information or content on the internet, including but not limited to posts or comments to blogs, internet journals, personal websites, social media, social networking or affinity net websites, chat rooms, online bulletin boards, or any other means of communication that take place over the internet. Um, are there any questions or comments on a social media policy as read? Yeah, well, and I'm not seeing any. I You're not so seeing, but my hand is up. Um, Oh, you, didn't, you didn't mention email. Should email be mentioned somehow? That, is that included in what you're saying or is there any reason to, to use, include it or not? Um, I would say no, because I would, I would say that social media, um, while, internet, while email does take place over the internet, I would argue that social media is more of a publication platform than it is a one-on-one -on -one messaging service. So for example, we wouldn't require that um, uh, all emails sent to and from the Environmental Commission email, which is environment, I believe, at bloomington.in.gov, um, uh, be approved or, or go through the chair or, or, or Linda or their designee if there's someone else in charge of that email account. I would say this is to keep in mind that this pro that this policy largely um, uh, impacts social media accounts such as Facebook, Twitter, um, any blog that the Environmental Commission might create in the future, um, those types of processes. 
um, or those types of platforms. Um, because I, I, I think it, it, it does um, make the most sense in, in terms of the policy that's, that's been written. Um, but this policy was written just so that there is um, a distinct uh, first an approval process for um, websites so that, you know, we just can't create new websites left and right and not get them approved by the commission. Um, it also uh, outlines what is and is not allowed on the social media page. So we don't have questions of, you know, is this allowed? Is this not allowed? Um, it, it pretty clearly defines as anything um, within the confines of our business um, and nothing else. Um, and then it, it creates um, uh, a, a chain of commands so that if something does happen where a post needs to be removed, it can be removed quickly and um, uh, by Linda, myself, or our designee. Um, but that's just uh, my, my general thinking on the process and on as I was writing it, um, why I created it. Because I just wanted to make, I didn't want to create social media pages for the commission without having a policy in place to actually govern those same social media pages. I thought that was an unwise idea. Um, I'm, I support that part of it about re regulating what we put on the Environmental Commission's social media page. I'm skeptical about us regulating what people do with their personal communications. I don't know if the city has any policy on that, but it seems like that's <laughs> my, our purview to me. I can show that's been removed from never been a problem before. I wouldn't expect it to be a problem with this this particular group, but um, um, you're right. Um, th this policy, we haven't run this policy past uh, city legal yet. So again, I would propose that we hold off. Uh, but um, what you brought up, Mike, is a really, really good point because uh, if we write a policy regarding um, what you can and cannot say, on your, um, you know, on your social media account is is really opening a big can of First Amendment worms, um, and um, it's kind of scary because they're just like waiting in the wings. If I can sound so conspiracy theorist, um, to uh, uh, nail us for First Amendment. Um, problems so it has to be and and what you did ask about if the city had a policy the city doesn't actually have a policy on it but if you go to the city's web page which is where the ec's web page would be hosted there is um um a con uh uh, things the there is a list of how you should conduct yourself on there. You know that if if you say something inappropriate, the city will just remove it. You know, so that's already there. But um, I I definitely don't think that any of this uh, this should be voted on until it goes past a lawyer. Okay, I want to clear up some misconceptions because I think some people are confused a little bit. The sections regarding individual commissioners has been removed entirely. That's no longer in the amendment at all that I just read to you. This is all pertaining to commission websites that we create or social media accounts that we create as a body. It does not apply to anything anyone has individually. The individual social media policy I created in response to a member of the Bloomington Parking Commission posting extremely homophobic and sexist posts and transphobic posts on a social media page, which caused backlash for the city. That's why I created the policy. It was based off a policy created in Massachusetts by the town of Sandwich, Massachusetts, that they use because, um, at least in Massachusetts, uh, political appointees, boards, and commissions have different legal rights than private citizens do. Now, I ran that by City Legal. I did send it to City Legal. I sent it to Mike Rooker. Um, he got back to me that he um, did not think that it would fly in an Indiana court. Um, and as a result, I pulled that part of the amendment. The amendment presented currently only applies, and I want to stress this up, underscore it significantly, only applies to commission-made social media accounts. So that Facebook post account we just created, that falls under this guideline. Your individual Facebook post as a private citizen or my individual Facebook post as a private citizen is not impacted any way. She want to make sure that that's, that's known, um, that what we're voting on is how to govern the Facebook page that will be created by Ben 
not the one that Ben has as a private citizen. I just want to make that clear. I misread that, Ben. I take it back. I, I appreciate you clearing that up, Andrew. Um, do you have any idea if any other boards and commissions have such uh, a policy? Because just like the uh, last one I discussed, I wouldn't want uh, um, all the different boards and commissions to all have different policies, mm. you know, separate from each other. Mm. Myself, so after the city um, had the incident, Incident where a member of the parking commission was removed from the parking commission for inappropriate Facebook posts. Myself and a couple other chairs of uh, various Bloomington commissions, so for example, the Human Rights Commission, um, and I worked on um, the idea of forming a, a social media policy, and they advised me to be the one to work on it uh, at the forefront. So I worked on that policy um, with the idea of it being a model for other boards commissions moving forward. We then were told by city legal they did not think that the Indiana Constitution or the Indiana courts would permit that sort of policy making at this time. And so I pulled that section of the amendment while keeping the rest of the amendment intact for, for governing social media pages. So yes, the original amendment you received included um, regulations on private Facebook pages, but that's been removed in the second amendment that I sent out um, subsequently after I received word from Mike Rooker at city legal. But to, to to what to the actual question? No, I do not believe that any other commissions currently have a social media policy in place. Um, but I also don't know how Indiana clarify or classifies us as individuals as members of this commission, whether mm -hmm. we're considered fully private citizens or semi-private citizens or government appointees. I don't know what we're classed as. Um, and I think that's quite into a bit more before they give us a total up or down vote on this uh, policy. If that makes sense. So Linda, are you still suggesting that this should go to the city's lawyers before we vote on it? Well, I, um, I was because I didn't realize Andrew had talked to Mike Rooker already. Um, do you want me to read the, the policy again? Because it only limits it to the pages that we would create. And I, I think if I read it again, that might right. I would assuage feel you. More, I would feel more comfortable if it, if it went through him, through the attorney before we vote on it. But that's just my opinion and you guys are the, the voters here. <laughs> I have to say, and this is a rare instance where I, where, I, where I disagree with Linda, I don't see the harm in this policy. It does nothing to restrict so First Amendment rights. Um, this policy is focused primarily and solely on um, governing what we post as a body on the page, the same way we have a policy in place to govern how we submit letters to the editor or guest columns to the HT under our name. This is a policy of what we post under our name online as an environmental commission. Um, so again, it doesn't impact your private pages. Um, it's just governing the process of posting on our Facebook page for the Environmental Commission the same way it govern, uh, we have a policy governing how we submit guest columns and letters to the editor. I would split hairs or split between both Linda and you. Uh, uh, and I would think we could go ahead and vote on it, but also I would encourage, therefore, with the caveat being that it be submitted to legal. Uh, if it's gonna be used as a model, I think then it should get the um, legal's approval uh, that they've looked at what we've done and we are then, therefore, hopefully the other commissions can follow, you know, the, it sets up a policy for all the commissions. Does that make sense? So I would accept a motion then to approve the amendment number two for social media policy pending approval by city legal. So moved. Moved by Mike. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All right, moving down the list, Bailey. Yes. Matt. Uh, yes. Susanna? Yes. Don? 
Yes. I vote yes. Shelby? Yes. Mike? Yes. Dave? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. I'll send that to Mike Rooker um, again uh, tomorrow. Um, or I'll send, I won't send it to Mike Rooker. I'll send it to someone else within City Legal. Mike Rooker's on vacation until mm. after the holidays. Um, I'll, I'll send an email to someone within City Legal, probably Daniel Dixon or Larry Allen, um, to try and get them to get that approved as speedily as possible. But it might take until after the holidays, depending on who all is on vacation within the city. Um, all right, so uh, that's been approved pending approval from city legal department. Um, we'll move on if there's no further discussion on to commissioner announcements. Um, we'll go down the roll call list in the same order for announcements. Bailey, do you have an announcement for us this evening? No. Matt? Um, yeah, I guess I wanted to announce people um, who are in this position may already be aware of it, but a number of our terms are slated to end January 31st, 2021, if we don't apply once again. So Bailey, Susanna, Don, Mike, and myself are the people that I believe are in that position. Um, if you're one of those people and you want to remain on the commission, um, please fill out the form that I found confusing. And if you have questions, ask Linda, because that helped me out. Um, <laughs> uh, other than that, yeah. Um, no announcements. One question is, is the January meeting to be the bucket list meeting? Mm. That's a great question. <laughs> um, Linda, did we settle on doing the bucket list meeting the same meeting as the election, which would be February? That's a lot for uh, one meeting. I don't think we decided that they would have to be on the same, the same day, the same month. Okay. Um, Don. Seems like on this, if we're going to be spending time on the, the uh, climate plan, maybe we better put off the bucket. Mm -hmm. Good point. I don't think, so elections should not take that long. Historically speaking, there's been very few contested races for environmental commission officers. If there was a contested race, I say it would be, you know, enough time for each a candidate to give a three to five minute little spiel. Um, and then we'd have a secret balloting. Linda would count the ballots and then we'd, we'd move forward from there. Um, but, but we're not going to have elections in January now. No, we're going to in February, which is why I'm saying if we are working on the climate action plan in January and we wanted to bump back the bucket list meeting to when we have elections in February, I don't think elections and the bucket list being in the same meeting is too much. I think it's manageable. Agreed. Because we've done it in the past, haven't we? We've had the election in January and then we have bucket list in January. Yeah, so it's manageable from a historical perspective. I think we'd be fine. Okay, so do we want to plan on having our bucket list meeting in February at the election? And we all do the climate, since the climate action plan is so time sensitive and we don't know when the cutoff will be for comments, we'll do that in January. Okay, sounds best for me. Um, is there anything further from you, Matt, for your report? All right, Susanna, any report from you? No, just hope you all have a nice uh, Hanukkah or Christmas or however you say celebrate. Thank you, and you as well. Um, Don, any report? Nothing other than that um, let's be careful out there as far as uh, the COVID. The numbers are bad, and uh, things are going to get worse, so be careful. Uh, I have no report because Matt and Susanna both stole mine, so... <laughs> Moving on to Shelby, do you have a report? No, I don't. All right, what about you, Mike? Nothing. And finally, last but not least, our dear friend, Dave. I'm Zooming, and that helps protect me from COVID. Um, I just thought I'd mention that I got so tired of looking at my messy office that I, 
I figured out how to get a background and this background that I have here is a huckleberry plant that has frost on its leaves and it's up in the Boundary Waters canoe area. Nice. Nice. We should all have wonderful plant backgrounds. We're the Environmental Commission after all. Um, so I'll, uh, there you go, Bailey. I have tons in my living room, but I don't have a desk in there, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so uh, I just have cats running around. Since we have um, no nice further business. Cat. Since we have no further uh, items on the agenda, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. moved. Second. No roll call needed for adjournment. Thank you. We're adjourned right now at 7.50 p.m. Thank you all for coming tonight. Happy holidays. Stay safe. Stay warm. And uh, uh, stay thankful. Have a great one. Happy holidays, everybody.